Welcome to the Palm Springs Drive Church of Christ, where we worship God and study His Word and love one another and reach the lost. As was announced, uh, my sermon today is going to be a shorter sermon so that we can let out a little early for our family uh, meeting. And as you also know, we are in the midst of a series on elders, on shepherds. And we've decided that since today I'm going to do a shorter sermon, we will postpone the third lesson in this series till next week. So I'm going to talk about something totally different. And I'm going to talk to you about the reign of King Jesus. Recently in our Bible class today and on Wednesday, we talked about the promise that that God made to David, that his son, that one of his descendants would reign on the throne forever. And as Brian talked about in in his class today, that promise was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Solomon would definitely become a king, and his throne would be established, but Solomon could not be king forever. And so, what does that really mean? As we think about this idea of Jesus reigning as king. What, what does that really mean? What does that say about him? What does that say about his work? What does that mean for us in our, in our lives? Well, what we're going to do is try to answer those questions by taking a glimpse in the book of Revelation as we take a, a peek into heaven itself and see the reign of Jesus. So we're going to be starting here in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, as we look at the first of three aspects of the kingship of Jesus, and that is the, he is the victorious descendant of David. So John is seeing this vision. Now this is symbolic because it's a vision, but God is on His throne and all of His glory, and He has in His right hand, as we read in verse 1, I saw in the right hand of who, Him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Now, this doesn't mean a book as we think of a book. Books weren't invented yet, but it's a scroll. And so this scroll is sealed with seven seals, so seven clumps of clay that are holding it closed. And this this scroll basically represents the unfolding will of God going forward. Now that Jesus has died on the cross, what else does God have in store from that point forward? Verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. So I want us to see what John saw, see and picture this strong angel. And he's saying, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly, John says, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. So it would be a very sad thing if God's will moving forward would not be able to be accomplished. That would be very sad. Verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. He says the one that was prophesied about to David, that descendant of David that would be king forever, he's here. He has arrived. He has died on the cross. He has risen from the dead. He has ascended into heaven. And now he's arrived. He is here. And he calls him the root of David. Now, as you think of that, don't think of like the roots underneath a tree and that's it. That's not the picture here. The picture is from Isaiah chapter 11 and this shoot that came out from the root. So it's the idea of like a tree that's been cut down. Like you see in this picture, this this olive tree that's been burnt out. And you see all these new shoots that have come from the same roots of that dead tree. And so it was that the dynasty of David appeared to have just been finished. But it's not finished. Because the root of David has come forth forevermore. In chapter 3 and verse 21 of Revelation... 
He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What a, what a powerful image this is. It's a co-reign of a father and of a son. And it's also the reigning of those who overcome, that is you and I, who get to reign with Jesus, as Brian talked about in his lesson. You know, sometimes we get this picture of heaven and we just think, we just try to think about eternity and what, what all we're going to do in heaven. And we might sometimes think, well, does that mean we're just going to kind of sit in front of His throne and sing songs all the time and, and worship just all, it's going to be like this, just eternity of just sitting and worshiping and singing. I love worshiping, but that's not all that's going to be happening in heaven. There's going to be raining. And kids, I don't mean rain like precipitation coming down. Rain like ruling. I don't know what all that involves, but it sounds like we're going to be busy. He's going to be using us. And also a point we can learn from this is there is no such thing as premillennialism. Premillennialism is a myth. It is a fable. It is a false doctrine. It takes the figurative book of Revelation and tries to literalize the symbols, which you can't literalize symbols. Symbols represent literal truth, but the symbol is not literal. So we're looking for the literal truth behind the symbol. So anyway, I can't go all into that, but pre-millennialism, pre means before, millennial means a thousand. And the idea of that false doctrine is that when Jesus returns, that He will establish a literal thousand year reign on earth in Jerusalem, sitting on David's literal physical throne. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is king now. He is the victorious descendant of David, ruling on the throne as we speak, ruling from heaven. He is the victorious descendant of David. Secondly, He is the eternal warrior king. Let's turn now our Bibles to Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19. And begin in verse 11. Again, if you want to understand what John understood, you have to first see what John saw with your mind's eye. Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened. See it in your mind. And behold, a white horse. Can you see it? And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges, and listen to this, wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. Can you see them? And on His head are many diadems, many crowns. And He has a name written on Him which no one knows except Himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And His name is called the Word of God. Remember in the beginning, the Word was with God. God was God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following Him on white horses. From His mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it He may strike down the nations, and He will rule them with a rod of iron. There are all these references to the Old Testament here. No direct quotations, but countless references. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is in the process of conquering evil now. If we have a misconception of what we might be doing in heaven, we might also have a misconception of what Jesus is doing. Is he just sitting there at God's right hand? I mean, he's just sitting around like all the time, just maybe listening to the wonderful singing and not really a whole lot to do. He's already accomplished everything. That is not the picture, the full picture that we get of Jesus' reign in heaven. He is conquering evil. 
He is waging a spiritual battle against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. He is subjecting all of His enemies under His feet. He's not done yet. His work is not done yet. In the end, He will subject all things under His feet. The last enemy that will be conquered is death. He will destroy Satan himself as Revelation describes. But He is carrying on that work now. And how long will He reign? Look at chapter 11 and verse 15. Chapter 11 and verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Daniel 2 and verse 44 prophesies that when the kingdom of God would be established, that the kingdom of God will crush and put an end to all the kingdoms of the earth. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, is a kingdom that is not limited by land or by language or by nationality. It is a spiritual kingdom that is all over this world of people who have submitted to the King Jesus Christ. And He reigns from heaven. And even when this earth is destroyed, He continues reigning in heaven for all eternity. He is the eternal warrior king. Thirdly, He is the comforting shepherd lamb. In chapter 7... At the end of this chapter, there's a beautiful description of what heaven will be like. And in verse 16, beginning, They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, pay attention to this, in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Here Jesus is pictured as a lamb, as He is often throughout Revelation. Earlier in the book of Revelation, He he was a lamb that was standing as if slain. So He had His his throat had been slit, but He was standing and alive. This is the Christ who was crucified, but had raised from the dead and had defeated death. But He's a lamb because He has given Himself as a sacrifice for the world. But here is the idea of a shepherd lamb, which is an ironic picture, isn't it? Because normally you you have the sheep, you have the lamb that is led by a shepherd. Here it is the lamb that is our shepherd. And he will guide us to springs of the water of life. What is the literal truth behind the symbol? Because Jesus is not literally a lamb. The truth is, The literal truth is that in heaven He takes care of His victorious saints. Do you dream of heaven? Of all things to meditate on, meditate on heaven. What will it be like to be in the presence of the King of Kings and for Him personally to sustain us to give us everything we need to dwell in perfection with Him in bliss in His very immediate presence. We need to dream about heaven. It is fascinating to me that Jesus is described in Revelation not only as a lion and a lamb, but also as a warrior and a lamb at the same time. Which one will He be for you? Will He be a warrior to punish you for your wickedness? Or will He be a comforting lamb to lead you to springs of the water of life? It all depends on how you come to King Jesus. So that leads to three practical applications let's make in closing. And trust me, it was hard to get all this in a 15-minute talk. (laughs) We could talk about it for 15 hours. Number one, submit to the King of Kings. If He is indeed the King of Kings, then what we need to do is submit to Him, knowing His mighty power and fearing His fierce wrath. If He is the King, 
then He makes the rules. Nobody goes to a king and says, uh, Mr. King, uh, I, I just have thought of some ways that I think you would probably like to be served. I mean, they're, they're not exactly what you said to do, but they're things I came up with, and I'd kind of like to just do those. No, that's not what you'd say to the king. That's not what you'd do for the king. You say to the king, I'll do whatever you tell me, and you do whatever he tells you because he's the king. And we should serve Him in reverence, in awe, and in honor. Secondly, do not despair. Do not despair. Don't be troubled about the injustices of life. About the power of Satan that is overwhelming and is everywhere. Christ will straighten it all out in the end. He will be victorious. He will punish all wickedness. He will defeat Satan himself. He, as our King of kings, as the root and descendant of David, will usher in justice and righteousness forevermore. Do not despair. And thirdly, be patient. Jesus said in Revelation 22, in verse 12, Revelation 22, I'll read 12 and 13. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This, of course, was written to a first century audience that was being persecuted terribly. And they were wondering, when is my reward coming? When is all of this going to be straightened out? And he said, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. Brethren, do you believe that one day you will reign with the King of Kings in heaven for all eternity? I mean, if you really believe that, then what are these trials? They're nothing. It's just a temporary setback. Bear patiently through the trials of this life it will be more than worth it when we get to heaven. In conclusion, I just want to read verses 16 and 17 of this chapter. Verse 16, Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. I think it's fascinating that among the last things that Jesus ever said to us, in the Bible. The, the very last thing is in verse 20. Yes, I am coming quickly. This is the next to the last thing He tells us. He is the root and the descendant of David. Don't ever forget that. Take comfort in that. Verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. The invitation is yours. And the invitation is from the Lord Himself. He invites you to come and take the water of life freely. The gift of salvation is free. But you have to come submitting to the King of Kings, bowing the knee before Him by believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing His name, and being baptized. If you'd like to do that today, we'd love to assist you if you'd come as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Oh,